Super, uh, super, oh, some Christopher Clark, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> 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 Clark, yeah, some um, So, first of all, as a fellow West Midlands citizen, I think your point about the West Midlands was absolutely brilliant. I think I can probably name most every single West Midlands MP, but can't name a single MEP, which is quite a different situation. Um, but given your areas of expertise, I'd just like to ask you quickly a completely different question. So, firstly, what's your opinion on uh, Poland and the government there? So, law and order, what's going on? Do you think that's a successful movement? And secondly, what's your opinion on Germany as a power in Europe? Uh, do you think that's a good thing? Uh, Germany having such control over the European economy and the direction of Europe. Thank you. Well, very good questions. Um, the Law and Justice Party and the Law and Justice Party is very unpopular in the European Union and uh, they want to instigate, uh, they want to implement sanctions against Poland. Uh, they want to put economic sanctions, they want to take away voting rights from Poland uh, because Poland is not complying with all the European Union directives. Um, I'm not going to go into all the different areas of uh, dif difficulties and, and difference between the Polish government and the European Union. Uh, we simply don't have time, but there is a myriad of problems, from the bizarre to the sublime, uh, touching upon some of these differences. But the problem that we have here is that the Law and Justice Party has won the elections for the lower house, it's won the elections for the Senate, it's won the presidency. It's the first time that any political party has all three areas of government under its control. Today, it has about 54% uh, in the opinion polls. I would love for the Conservative Party to have those sort of popularity. Um, and it, it, it had in its manifesto that it was going to do, uh, implement reforms to the judiciary, uh, which is one of the biggest problems. Don't forget, some of the judges in the Polish judiciary, which is the largest and mo most inefficient in Europe, were appointed in the communist era. Now, I'm sure you can appreciate that uh, it's rather disconcerting for any government to have judges trying to overturn decisions implemented by the government who were appointed by communists in the 1980s. So, my attitude is you have to support the sovereign, democratically elected government. Because if the people don't like what it's doing, if the people think that what it's doing is unconstitutional or not in the interest of Poland, they have, they have the ability to throw them out. To throw out the president, to throw out the senators, to throw out the MPs, and we've got local elections coming up in October so they can send a strong message to the government, you're going about this the wrong way, we don't want you anymore, we're going to vote for the opposition. That's the natural process. But what's happening now is that the European Union, Mr. Timmermans, you've heard of him, and Mr. Verhofstadt and others, no accountability to the Polish people, no ability for the Polish people to throw them out or to, or, or to influence them anyway, anyway, by trying to take on the democratically elected government of Poland. And I find that really dangerous. It's a little bit like the House of Lords trying to take on the will of the British people over the Brexit referendum, trying to block a decision that the people took. And I think this is going to really create a lot of tensions because as these countries start to exert themselves and become more confident, they are going to start to stand up to the European Union. I said in the earlier speech to the students that all six countries that are not in the Eurozone will be forced to adopt the euro, and Poland is one of them. Today, in the opinion polls, 15% of Poles want to abandon their currency. 15%. But the European Union is going to say to them, you have no choice, you have to, you have to implement the euro. If they succeed, if they force the remaining six countries to implement the eurozone, then it's a single currency. Yet another plank to the supranationalist, supranational supra, supra state structure which, that they are trying to put in, in, in place. And um, as I said before, the, one of the reasons we are able to pull out is the vision and the courage of the British people, the prescience, I would say, of the British people at the turn of the century when they said, you will not 
abandon our currency. It was the British people who said that. You're all too young to remember, but I remember campaigning in the 2001 general election, uh, where the campaign was, uh, you have 24 hours to save the pound. Um, the British people really told Gordon Brown and Tony Blair and everybody else, well, go along with this project, carry on, but getting rid of our currency is a step too far. And uh, they saved us, because if we had been part of the Eurozone, um, I think it would have been that much more difficult to extricate ourselves. Now, you've your second point is touched upon something which is hugely emotive for me and emotional for me. And I get a lot of stick for, 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 for talking about this subject. And it's Germany. And it's Germany and the power and influence of Germany on the continent of Europe. It's almost as if this is a taboo subject. We are not allowed to discuss how Germany is becoming so powerful and is controlling the whole of the European Union. Um, on Wednesday, I had a debate in the House of Commons on war reparations from Germany for Poland. And I've got, had a, a lot of abuse on social, on social media from young people who say, this is crazy. Why are you in 2018, referring to war reparations from the Second World War, which dated back, you know, 1945. Don't forget the Poles never received a penny in compensation during the Second World War. Six million Poles slaughtered in concentration camps and, 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 and in fighting. Warsaw, the city of my birth, 98% of it was flattened in 1944 by Adolf Hitler's forces. In, uh, in, uh, in retaliation for the Poles, <coughs> for the Warsaw Uprising, which is when the Poles tried to throw the Germans out, Adolf Hitler said he wanted Warsaw to be eliminated from, from the maps. My own grandfather's brother hid eight Jewish families on his estate, and as a result of that, had to watch his daughter, wife, being shot and himself being killed by the Germans because there was the death penalty in Poland for daring to help Jewish friends and neighbors. What these people went through is unimaginable, unimaginable. And we need to constantly refer to what happened during, during the Second World War. You young ladies and gentlemen are very intelligent people. You will know what happened during the Second World War. But in the latest opinion polls from the United States of America, I think more than Something like, I heard something like 70% of your age category in America don't know what the Holocaust was. Those are figures that have come from the United States of America. Quite breathtaking, really, when you think about it. And we have to constantly refer to that. Now, I believe that Germany is becoming far too powerful within the European Union. The currency is designed to help Germany because it had a strong currency. Countries like Greece, who benefited from having a weaker currency to help them with exports, they have been sacrificed like an, a sacrificial lamb on an altar, and they have seen the consequences of this harmonization between all of the countries. Germany only spends 1.19% of GDP on defense, whereas the figure is 2%. <coughs> we spend 2%, so do the Poles. We in the United Kingdom have to spend, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, vast amounts of your parents' money on the responsibilities that come with being a permanent member of the UN Security Council, i.e. nuclear weapons, which regrettably we have to have for the protection of the whole of the continent of Europe, and, and many other uh, issues. But Germany is becoming too powerful, and she is doing things which are really unsettling and frightening some of the other countries. I'll give you one example. Have you heard of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline? They are building an oil and gas pipeline from Germany directly to Russia under the Baltic Sea, bypassing all of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Slovakia. These countries get their energy and oil supplies as well from Russia. Germany now wants to build a pipeline directly to Russia, bypassing all of these countries. What do you think the Russians will do to these little countries in the event of a conflict or difficulties? They'll turn their taps off because they can still continue to supply their lucrative Western markets directly 
under this undersea nuclear <coughs> gas pipeline. So the Germans want you to have a common energy policy, but when it comes to protecting their own energy interests, they will do something else. And I think your generation, I very much hope you will have the courage to challenge the Germans when you think that they are being unreasonable and unfair with smaller countries. And I hope that you will challenge them over the direction that they are pushing the European Union towards, which is a homogenous single entity controlled from Brussels, ultimately, and Berlin. That is not in the interests of our continent. We have seen what has happened on our continent when a country has become too powerful. It's, it's happened throughout the whole of our history and where tensions grow. We must, we British, are the ones who have always maintained peace and security in Europe, and we must continue to do that. And if that means hard and difficult discussions with the Germans, then so be it. I've been invited by, for my first time, to go on their conference with a German Streifdung, which is a sort of think tank, and I'm going to see them um, on the 21st of this month. And I said to them, you realize I have all of these concerns about Germany, don't you? I'm going to be very forthright with what I'm going to say. And they said, yes, we know what your views are. We wanted to liven things up, so we invited you over. We, as, as friends and partners, we, we mustn't be fearful of challenging one, one, one another and speaking our minds. That's very, very important in a democratic process. Any further questions? Yes. yes. Uh, Daniel Dobrowski, College of St. Helens, AB. Um, so, uh, adding on to uh, that point and, and uh, further to our discussion earlier, um, I, do, I do very much agree that it is unsettling that the EU uh, feels the right to impose its, um, sort of its sovereignty or over the sovereignty of individual uh, governments. However, a skeptic might say that the sanctions on Poland um, could be a result of uh, uh, the Polish government deliberately sacking the courts uh, in its favour by removing um, anti PIS. Um, uh, judges, um, and perhaps there's, there's also been an argument that they may be um, restricted from the press, and, and this has also been seen to a greater extent in Hungary. Um, so would you say that in that respect, perhaps the EU is a useful uh, block to these sort of restrictions or freedoms imposed by the local government? Yeah, I understand your question entirely, and I, if you were dealing with some sort of banana republics and dictatorships, I could understand how the European Union would play an important part in holding uh, these countries to account. In reality, I go back to the earlier point, these are democracies. These are democracies who, by the way, are fledgling democracies. They were under the Soviet yoke from 1945 until 1989. But they are democracies nevertheless. And the Polish people have spoken, and they have decided to place their confidence in this party. Can I just say to you, the big problem that the government has got itself into is over the constitutional court. Uh, the Constitutional Court uh, is, has, has got something like, out of 19 uh, judges, it's got 18 judges appointed by the previous party that, that stacked it in their favour. All that this new government is trying to do is to recalibrate the structure of the court so it better reflects the disparate nature of the political process in, in Poland. It happens all the time in the United States of America. You know that uh, presidents can appoint judges to the Supreme Court when there is a vacancy. And it's, only it's only replacing judges when it's a vacancy. They're not getting rid of judges. They are just uh, reappointing judges in order to recalibrate the court so it's more balanced. No, I, uh, I don't believe it's, it's for the role for the European Union to interfere in those sort of, mac uh, in sort of micro uh, issues uh, which are domestic orientated and, and has to be left down to the Polish government, the Polish courts and the Polish people. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm the Green College. So we talked about defence tonight and defence is obviously quite a big issue when it comes to you know, people saying we should stay in the EU because of defence, defence papers, defence and neighbours and allies etc. And we talked about NATO. But with Trump's attitude towards NATO being somewhat ambivalent in the past few years, uh, and also Turkey's regime pushing them further away from Western liberal uh, ideals might be pushing them further away from siding with the West in, in, against people like Putin, 
What do you think the best attitude is towards Britain's defence policies post uh, Brexit, uh, considering that NATO needs a bit more bolstering and they might not necessarily listen to us? But then again, the EU is going to be the most reliable for, uh, body for, for defence as well. Mm. Well, look, let me just say something about Mr. Trump before uh, I come on to the defence issue of, of Europe. Um, Mr. Trump is a sort of uh, is, he's a sort of marmite character, isn't he? And he generates a lot of emotion. Um, I'm very interested in what he said recently. Uh, there was the photograph, if you remember, from the G7 of him sitting down and all of them sort of looking at him. What really worries me is just how our own media uh, dumbs, tries to dumb down the sort of uh, reporting of some of these things. Uh, we're told that Mr. Trump wants to start a sort of tr massive trade war with the European Union. But what you're not told is that he actually proposed a completely tariff-free agreement between the G7 nations. No tariffs whatsoever. That wasn't reported. How many of you heard those proposals? On, or you did hear those? Oh, good. Well done. Can I just say, is that a reflection of how the list of Mr. Trump understands about world trade, not sort of a, a complete desire to remove all tariff barriers? It's pretty clear that he is very, uh, his instincts are protectionist. Well, I mean, if, you, if you're offering, if you're putting on the table a complete uh, trade, uh, tr uh, a tariff-free pr proposition, uh, I would say that that's a good proposal. Well, I, if you, I think that it can also be other, uh, other problem though, is that most barriers to trade now, particularly on the G7, is not ones of um, tariffs, because tariffs are overall quite low. I think the average is about 2%. It's more sort of uh, the regulations which are the same have to be harmonised. But I think that's, again, what Mr. Trump doesn't understand. I think what you have to do is, and I've started to do this myself, and if you really want to get up under the skin of this issue, um, I've asked the House of Commons Ivory to give me all the breakdown of all the tariffs that exist between America and the United uh, between the United States of America and the European Union, uh, I've seen tariffs from the European Union for American goods as high as 25 or 30 percent instead of in certain automotive parts, engineering equipment, and other things. Some of their agricultural products have tariffs: uh, orange juice, uh, cereals. Uh, have tariffs as high as 14 or 15 percent. The European Union is a protectionist racket. And let's not forget that the Americans have a massive trade. I talked about our debts. The Americans are in debt to the tune of 17 trillion dollars, and they have a massive trade deficit with the European Union. Huge. Don't have a look at the tariffs that the European Union imposes. And you know, the European Union protects itself from what they call cheap imports. But these are things that all of us consume. And the poorest in our society, the poorest in our society, spend the most on food, clothing, and footwear. Those are the things that the European Union puts the highest rates on when goods are imported into the European Union from outside. So the, um, what's it called, the uh, trainers from India, uh, the T-shirt from Brazil, uh, the uh, coffee beans from Colombia, all of these things have massive tariff imports when they come into the European Union. I'm, I believe that we should have tariff-free uh, uh, agreements between ourselves and different countries. I'll give you a classic example. Coffee. coffee. When we import coffee into, into the European Union, there is no tax. No tax at all. Why? because no country in Europe grows coffee. We don't have the climatic conditions where we can grow coffee. Roasted coffee has a tariff of 18%. Uh, Why? Because it's subsidizing the inefficient coffee roasting for uh, industries of Germany and Italy, and it's trying to protect those uh, industries at the, <coughs> at the expense of the Colombian and Costa Rican coffee roasting industries. And this is why there is so much poverty around the world. When we, when we create this protectionist racket and prevent developing countries from exporting their raw goods to the European Union because of high tariffs, we give, as I said, 14 billion pounds a year in, in your money to, in, in, in international aid. 
I have some constituents who say to me, we should give no money in international aid. Charity begins at home, they say. And it's a real struggle to try to fight against some of those views. But I do believe that rather than giving international money, international aid and handouts, we should be helping these countries by lowering the barriers for them to export their goods to the European Union. I will send your president, actually, once I have all the figures from the House of Commons Library about the tariffs that the European Union has on every single product that's imported into our continent, whether it's from Colombia, whether it's from India, or whatever, because I want you to see for yourself just how high these tariffs are. And I'll give you just a little slightly flippant, uh, not serious issue, but Weatherspoons. I don't know whether any of you go to Weatherspoons. I'm sure you do. Is there a Weatherspoons here in Durham? I'm, I'm sure you do. Two? Right, well, we'll go there afterwards. Uh, the chap who runs Weatherspoon, he said something fascinating yesterday. He, when we go into Brexit, he has decided that he is going to now be buying more uh, Australian, uh, New Zealand wine, uh, British ciders and, and other ciders and beers from outside of the European Union. Because actually we will be able to now buy these products tariff-free. Tariff-free. If we have a free, the Australians want a free trade agreement with us, that means their beers come to us without any taxes, our beers go to their country without any taxes. So the price of these things will ultimately fall. Because you are not having to spend 10, 15, 20% on import duties. That's a very important thing. I will send your president those tariffs. I want you to see those. Next question? Yes. Jack Hillwood, Long Snow College. Uh, who do you think will uh, succeed to Lisa May as the next Pacific <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course I'm very loyal to the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> not thinking about the succession, <laughs> and I wish her many years of future uh, uh, you know, leadership. Uh, what can I say? I, um, I, I, uh, I like Jacob Rees Bock. <laughs> and people love, and I heard some guffaws there at the back, uh, people say, people criticise him for, um, people criticise him for the fact that he wears double-breasted suits. They criticise him that he has a posh voice and that he went to Eton. They criticise him uh, that he's from a privileged background. This is one of the most intelligent people that I've come across in the House of Commons. The House of Commons does not attract, actually, a lot of very, very articulate, clever minds. The greatest minds actually go into academia, to universities, run multinational businesses. Politicians are, in the main, not, and oh, I shouldn't be saying this when you're filming this, but <laughs> politicians, we don't have, we're not, let's put it like this, we're not awash with great intellectual minds. Of course there are intelligent people in the House of Commons. But I would like to see, I want us to judge people on their intelligence and where they want to take the country, their vision, and the way they treat other people. He's never lost his temper. He's always courteous to people. No matter how difficult the debate, he always goes up and engages and congratulates the other person. I'm looking for that sort of civility. And those sort of, I'm looking for a leader that will accentuate all of those qualities. And he's got it in spades. He's certainly one to watch. If not leader, then certainly speaker of the House of Commons or foreign secretary or one of the great officers of state. I think we have to judge people uh, by many, many things, but not what class they are, or how they speak, um, or any of those things. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel very strongly about that. So he's, he's certainly a contender. Yes? If I turn the camera off, will we give a different answer? No, no, no. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm a re-smog man, I've, I've made that quite public. But of course, you know, there are some very interesting characters coming along. Uh, we got, uh, I, um, I was, uh, uh, I think that uh, it, will, it will skip a generation. Uh, I, I will never forgive, uh, and I don't mind this being recorded, I will never forgive uh, the uh, 
crazy situation between Boris Johnson and Michael Gove um, after uh, well, during the leadership contest. These men have known each other for over 25 years. So how they managed to create that sort of scenario where they both sort of eliminated one another out of the race. My whole mind at that time was, we've got Brexit, how do I secure a Brexit Prime Minister? That was my calculation. And everything I was doing was trying to ensure that we had a, an authentic Brexit Prime Minister. Somebody who had decided to campaign for Brexit in the referendum. I think Mr Cameron and others put a lot of pressure on some of these ministers to back the government line. And it took a great deal of courage for some of them to come out in favour of Brexit. And I think the British people then sensed something was happening. If, the, if Mr Cameron and the whole cabinet had united and come out in favour <coughs> of Remain, I think, I think that may have tipped the balance. You never know. But it's because there were real people with conviction and courage who said to the Prime Minister, no, we may be friend, your friends, we may be partners and colleagues, but we don't agree with you on this, and we have, have to campaign for Brexit. I was delighted that we had that authentic, <coughs> hard debate in the run-up to the referendum. But I won't forgive the crazy situation between Gove uh, and Boris Johnson, which then led to a Remainer uh, becoming our Prime Minister. I have confidence in the Prime Minister. I, I'm hoping she will deliver what she has outlined in her Mansion House and Lancaster House speeches and in her speech uh, which she made in Italy last year, outlining her vision for Brexit. But she campaigned for Remain. And she was actually not a very... Um, she didn't campaign a lot during the campaign. She rather was quite quiet during the referendum campaign which disappointed me. But I have confidence in her and I hope that she will deliver. What is crucially important is that the Conservative Party comes together. If we are divided on this issue, and if the British people see us continuing to fight with one another, then I think that we are likely to lose the next general election. People do not like divided parties. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask um, two quick questions on the subject of the EU. Um, firstly, what do you think sort of is the um, solution, as it were, to the problem of the overbearing power of the EU? Do you think sort of Brexit, um, accompanied by sort of increasing Euroscepticism across the continent, will force it into reform, um, into becoming, into um, firstly, you know, um, uh, maybe um, just um, sort of. Uh, shrinking in its scale and not in sort of involving itself in as many areas of policy and operating a bit more um, uh, openly and, um, and democratically, or do you think it will sort of be pushed to the brink, um, at the breaking point, and require the disintegration of the bloc um, um, uh, altogether? And secondly, what is your take on sort of the current um, state of the government's? Uh, attempt at Brexit negotiations, considering sort of the ping pong of a <coughs> between the Lords and the Commons, days ago, seem to result in in the government accepting a key amendment from the Lords, which in all but um, in all but name, essentially, even they they didn't want, really want to admit that they accepted it, which essentially took no deal off the table by giving Parliament control of the negotiations. I believe after after the end of the, of the transition period, meaning that they would surely uh, vote against. Um, any attempt the government made for a no deal, therefore sort of um, uh, um, somewhat depriving us of a bargaining ship and weakening our position. I just wanted to ask you know, what you made of that. Okay, um, very good question. I, I mean, really, what, what's going to happen? Well, it's too early to tell. It, it's far too early to tell. I, it, I, when Britain pulls out and we um, start to do our own trade policies and we're, we're operating as a sovereign nation, um, people will be looking at us very, very intently, um, very intently. As I said to you, extricating yourselves from the, no country has taken on the European Union and lived to tell the tale. No country has done it. When the people of Denmark and the people of Ireland and the people of France, when they had referenda on the Maastricht Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty, and they got the decision wrong, they were told to vote again, and they voted right the next time. <coughs> no country has actually taken on the European Union. 
because it's a huge threat to the European Union. If a country can leave and thrive and succeed, what's the purpose of the European Union? Um, so countries will be watching us. If, if I am wrong, if we fail, if the economy is doing badly, if we fall behind the other European countries, um, which I do not believe will happen, I have every, every bone in my body believes that this country will thrive outside of the European Union. But if I'm wrong, clearly there will be people calling for us to rejoin and the Eurosceptic movements on the continent of Europe will wither on the vine and their causes will be set back uh, decades. But don't forget, there are literally hundreds of millions of people on the continent of Europe who are also Eurosceptics. They may live in countries that are members of the European Union, but they too yearn for freedom, like, like many people in this country. They too want their parliaments to, to be sovereign. They too want to hold their own parliaments uh, to account. So they will be watching like hawks as well. And if we thrive, other countries will want to pull out of the European Union and they will want to join us and others in what we always wanted, which is common defence posture through NATO and a trading organisation which facilitates the free movements of goods and services. The free movement of people, for us, is a step too far. We welcome immigrants. I'm an immigrant to this country myself. We now have a million Poles living in this country, and they contribute a huge amount to our economy. But we have to manage the immigration process. And why should the low-skilled Bangladeshi, uh, sorry, why should the highly skilled Bangladeshi IT consultant find it a hundred times more difficult to get into this country than the low-skilled worker from, from Bulgaria? Surely our immigration policy should be colorblind. We should accept the brightest and the most talented people from all over the world to our country. And we should decide who comes into our country. I want our country to attract some of the brightest from India and from the Commonwealth countries and from Nigeria and others. At the moment, there is a free-for-all. And the free movement of people is fine if you have a completely homogenous continent with the same language, the same standard of living, and the same everything else. But that's not the case. There are two countries that speak English in the European Union, ourselves and Ireland, which is the international language, English. So of course, if you're a low-skilled worker in Bulgaria, you're not going to come and look for work in Helsinki. You're going to come to London. If you're a low-skilled worker in Budapest, you're not going to go to Copenhagen. You're going to come to London. And this is why there has been such a huge flow of people to the United Kingdom, which has genuinely caused consternation and problems amongst our electorate. They see uh, massive house-building uh, uh, schemes which are not keeping up with housing requirements. They see a lack of space in local schools and hospitals and they worry that our immigration policy is getting out of control. So we want a system which is free movements of goods and services, a trading block, but a block which guards and protects the sovereignty of each nation state, its parliament and its courts. If we can get back to that sort of thing, then I think we can create an alternative to the European Union based on that. And by the way, why should we have a monopoly? Why should one idea have a monopoly on the continent of Europe? Surely the continent of Europe can have more than one idea or one vision. And surely it should be for each nation to decide what it wants. If you want to give up your sovereignty, if you want to give up your currency, if you want to give up your army, if you want to give up your parliament, your president and all of the other things, if you want to be subsumed into a single entity, if you want to do that, great. But particularly if your own people want you to do that, great. Carry on. But it is not suitable for every single country on the continent of Europe. We all think differently. We are different people. We should celebrate those differences.
these countries have evolved over thousands of years. The, the culture, the language, the history. And we should protect those. Those are very, very special things. I'm British and I'm Polish. But these two countries are completely different. The mindset is completely different. The history is completely different. Why try to cement these countries together into an artificial block? Let them thrive and prosper as individual sovereign nations whilst cooperating on the important things that matter, such as NATO, defense, but also space program. I think we should still continue to be in the, in the Galileo space program with the European Union. I don't think we need to have our own space program. We should throw our lot in with the European Union if they're prepared to allow us uh, to do that. You know, these are all very, very important things. That was your first question. I've forgotten your second question. Um, about the, the government's negotiation. Oh yeah, the negotiation. Very quickly. Uh, look, the most controversial vote we had this week was the meaningful vote. Of what they refer to the meaningful vote. They want, uh, and I can understand why the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats and the SNP and uh, the Pride Comro and the Green MP, I can understand why they don't have confidence in us. Uh, to secure the best possible deal for the United Kingdom. If Mr. Corbyn was the Prime Minister, I wouldn't have confidence in him negotiating the best possible deal for the United Kingdom. So I understand that. And of course they are fulfilling their role as the, as the opposition in saying to us, we don't trust you to get the best deal, you've got to come in front of us and we will sanction it or reject it. What I can't forgive are Conservative members of Parliament who stood on the same platform as the Prime Minister, who are now, in my view, trying to undermine the Prime Minister, and trying to bind her hands as she goes into the negotiations. We've got very little time left to secure uh, this agreement with the European Union, and we need to give the Prime Minister as much flexibility and leeway as possible to negotiate the very best terms for the United Kingdom. And that's why Parliament should not try to restrict the Prime Minister in these negotiations. We haven't actually seen the terminology of the amendment that's been put down on this. That's coming out this evening at 9 o'clock. Well, it, it will be on the order paper now. We're going to see it now, the exact amendment that's been put down on this. Both sides seem to be saying the Prime Minister has satisfied them. Well, that's impossible. We're going to find out on Monday what the amendment is. But those of us who are Brexiteers under the European Research Group and Jacob rees mogg we are absolutely determined that we're going to deliver a Brexit, which means Brexit, i.e. returning to being a sovereign nation, controlling our trade policy, controlling our borders, and controlling our own courts, outside of the customs union, outside of the single market. That is our objective. And it will be for other it will be for your generation to decide whether or not we have done a good job, and you will have to take up the cudgels and, and, and decide the future of this country when your turn comes. But that is our intention, because we believe that's what the British people voted for. Yes. Hi, uh, Nicholas Smith, Rebellion College. So you're talking a lot about you seem to have a lot of optimism about Brexit, um, and I respect your confidence in you know Britain's obviously managed very well in the past, you know, in terms of dealing with, dealing with Europe. However, at a time when, um, you know, the Brexit Department has the highest turnover in civil service, when um, we're finding that, um, although you say leaders are coming to London to track free trade deals, and, but, you know, we have, for example, Narendra Modi who said that the precondition is, you know, agreements on students and visas, you know, people setting conditions for us, and, um, you know, um, there's talk about whether countries such as Canada or Australia are really going to give us these free trade deals that are actually work in our favour, you know, when we don't have the force of 500 million people and 28 countries behind us. Plus, added to that, the complexity, you know, how long has the Canada-EU trade agreement been, in, been going on? It's got six or seven years and it's still not uh, decided final terms. Can I ask uh, yourself, what gives you confidence that Britain will be able to agree to give to achieve these trade deals which will help us prosper. I agree that maybe 40, 50 years down the line um, we may be able to achieve a state, but I, in the short and medium term I can't, I'm very sceptical yeah. and quite pessimistic in that sense. So I don't know if you could enlighten me on that. Okay, well look, I mean, um, as I said before, you know, this country 
um, I had George Osborne, I don't know whether I've said this, but George Osborne, the fourth of the Chancellor, his father-in-law, who was a very seasoned politician, he was the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee in the House of Commons, and now he's the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee in the House of Lords, he said to me uh, the other day, his kit had been put on the ship to go to Suez, and uh, he was going to be sent to fight in Suez. And then they said to him, actually, it's all over, you don't need to go. And he said to me something very interesting. That was the point at which our civil servants here in this country started to talk about the need for Britain to join the European Economic Community. Suez, for us, was such a jolt, such a shake in our national confidence. We had gone ostensibly with the French to liberate, so-called, the Suez Canal after Colonel Nasser nationalized it. And we failed spectacularly. The Americans pulled the plug on us. We nearly uh, ran out of oil re reserves and, and, and hard currency. It was a disaster. And people started to talk about, well, we're too small. The empire has gone. We're a small little island. We've got to throw ourselves in with the European uh, economic community. And I have seen documents <coughs> from that time, uh, which again I will send to your president, uh, which clearly state that the civil service at that time knew what was going to happen in terms of getting rid of vast amounts of sovereignty. And they wanted us just to carry on this process until it was too late for the British people to change their mind. They realized that the British people did not want to give up so much sovereignty. But to answer your question specifically, what gives me the confidence? Well, look, you don't change circumstances overnight. Of course there's going to be turbulence. Of course there's going to be uh, a, a concern. And there's going to be uh, disquiet about the whole process and how quickly it will take. But if you have a vision, and if you believe in your country, and you're not going to take any decisions at all. You're not going to make any monumental decisions whatsoever for fear of destabilizing your country or economy. You know, sometimes there comes a moment in one's life, in a generation, in a point in history, where you have to decide the course that we're on is wrong and we want to start a new course. And we have the confidence in ourselves and in our institutions and in our people, and that's the most important thing, we have the confidence in our people to be able to make this a success. And I reiterate to you what I said before. The people on these islands are among some of the most innovative, some of the most tolerant, some of the most ingenious people in the world. And I have every confidence that we will make a success of this process. The British brand is gold standard. And when I travel around the world, we tend to hide our light under a bushel being British, and we're not necessarily overtly jingoistic or nationalistic. But when I go overseas, and I represent this country overseas, the interest in this country, the thirst for cooperating and work with us, working with us, is, is profound. And so many people want to invest in our country. The United Kingdom receives more foreign direct investment than any other country in the European Union. And the last thing I'd say to you is this. We had Operation Fear, did we not? That if we dared to vote for, the European, for Brexit, we would have unemployment rise by half a million, the economy would collapse, the exchange rate would collapse. None of that has happened. So can I just, I completely agree with you, and I, and I, I personally see myself as very patriotic, I'm very proud to be British, I uh, do have absolute faith in the British people. However, like, when we, to start with, we haven't left yet, and the fact that we've gone from being the fifth fastest growing economy in the EU to now the second slowest, to the 27th. Like we're, although I'm not saying, but like I don't believe in Project Fear either, like I think that's ridiculous, and I think if anything it harms the Remain campaign. Um, however, like, um, I, I respect the perspective, but I, I really, I can't place my faith in blind patriotism myself. Like, uh, no. Um, I, I understand where you're coming from with that, but... Um... I understand it, but the only thing I can say to you is that, look, I went into the election, uh, I went into the referendum uh, night, uh, fully expecting to lose. Um, the Member of Parliament relies on the support of his association. Uh, I have 650 members of the Conservative Party in Shrewsbury, and I have 20 people who run the local party. 18 out of the 20 were for Remain. Okay. 
they were at one end of the league. Normally, you go into an election, you know, and yeah. you're all wearing blue rosettes, and you're all huddled together in the corner, and you're all campaigning. I was Billy Nomades at one end of the uh, uh, sports uh, field, not sports hall. The rest of my association were all at the other. It was a very disconcerting and strange moment. Um, but I so believed in, in this because I myself have been working with European politicians for the last two decades. And it was their complete indifference and contempt for the British position which made me realise that this was not right for us. And the British people have spoken, right or wrong, and there were wrongdoings and there, there were you know, misconceptions on both sides. The British people, I think, are intelligent enough to set aside all of that, all that waffle and make a decision. And they have, and we need to respect it. Future generations will have to assess that decision and decide what, what sort of a Britain they want. But for now, we've made the decision that we need to get, get on with it. Um, I think sadly we need to pause there because obviously we've got elections to run uh, this evening. However, you are all entitled to come back to the reading room after those elections. Well, uh, even before those elections are finished, the reading room is going to be set up. So if you didn't get to ask a question, um, feel free to come back, have wine, enjoy our bar, and uh, ask questions to Daniel um, during that time. Um, if you wish to stay for the elections afterwards, um, that, that is fine. But as I said, there is free wine available at the reading room. Um, but uh, before we go any further, one final round of applause for Daniel.